Before humans came here, there were so many seabirds that they would blacken the skies. You could not see the stars. But these days, we have changed all the habitat and their numbers are greatly reduced now, but they're still here. There's been a huge number of people coming together to figure out how can we benefit all of these species. Seabirds are often referred to as ecological engineers. They feed on small fish and squid, which are really high in nutrients. And then when they return to land to breed, they deposit these nutrients back into the environment. Seabirds live along coastlines and open oceans all over the world. They've pioneered volcanic islands like Hawaii since the land first rose from the sea, helping life take hold by depositing mineral-rich guano that became the first soil. They were the first ones here to bring the nutrients, to help the plants grow, to start the whole island ecosystem. Seabirds continue to provide a critical link between land and water. But today, these ocean-going travelers are under threat. Populations have declined almost 70% since the 1950s. And this is a result of many different threats that seabirds face, both at land and at sea. Every year, commercial fishing kills hundreds of thousands of seabirds by accidentally hooking them or entangling them in nets. But it's during their short but critical time on land that the birds are most vulnerable when they return to breed at the sites where they were born. On the island of Maui, one seabird, the Oahu Kani, or wedge-tailed shearwater, lost a beachfront rookery to human encroachment. This was historically always a nesting site for the Uaukani, and through human development, it turned into a resort center with condos and other development, and the Uaukani were not present there for many years. Humans brought other threats as well, invasive hunters. Originally, habitat change was the most significant change for the bird's environment. But now, the predators are the major problem for these birds when they're on the land. All of these birds evolve over their entire millennia of life without having predators to deal with. Non-native predators, like rats and mongooses, have decimated seabird populations. They dig into the birds' burrows and eat their eggs and chicks. All of these predators were introduced by people. The very early ships came and rats ran off of the ships when they were tied to shore. Cats came. The mongoose were actually introduced to control rats in the sugarcane fields. In 2001, there were very few Uaukani burrows out there. The nesting site that once supported thousands of birds was down to just 16 nesting pairs. Then, one local resident decided to do something about it. There was a local fisherman that had noticed carcasses of the Uaukani turning up when he would go out to fish. So he contacted the state department and they implemented a predator control program. Government agencies teamed up with volunteers from the community to target non-native predators. And we bait these live traps and we check them every day. And then when the free-ranging cat or the mongoose gets captured in the trap, we remove it from the colony. They also installed signs and fencing to steer people away from the nesting site. Over the years, Jenny and her team have seen the impact of their efforts. When we come back year after year, we're able to see that this is the same pair that was here last year and the year before. And so we see in this area, it's very dense. We see burrows just right on top of one another. You get more and more burrows every year. But not all seabirds on Maui can find the natural habitat they need to nest. Critically endangered a'o, or Newell's shearwaters, prefer burrows beneath ferns and tree roots on steep slopes. So Jay Pinneman and his team at the Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project are taking an innovative approach, creating a custom-made refuge tailored to the bird's needs. 
here on the northwest slopes of Maui, at a place called Makamaka Ole. They've transformed land previously used for cattle grazing into a seabird safe haven. The major predator control effort here is this predator-proof fence. The enclosures have a hood that prevents animals from being able to climb over them. They have mesh that's small enough that the mice and the rats cannot get through. It has a skirt that goes under the ground. But guarding against invasive predators is just the first step. The team also works to restore native plants the birds depend on. The fences went up and then we immediately started working on rehabilitating the habitat trying to take out the invasive plants and to encourage the native plants that were remaining to continue to grow. Most critically, they hope to reestablish the iconic ohia tree. Its roots provide structure for the seabird's nests, and its high tops are perfect takeoff spots. The birds will actually climb the ohia trees and get up to where they can leap off and just catch the wind underneath their wings. Today, volunteers help restore this critical native habitat. I've been working with a group called the Native Hawaiian Plant Society. This morning, I started working with clearing and making space for the native ohia lehua to grow. Until the ohia trees mature, clearings leave room for takeoff and artificial burrows stand in for the tree's roots, providing an ideal place to nest. The refuge just needs one more thing, seabirds. And nothing works better to draw them in than birds of a feather. Seabirds are social animals. They want to be near others of their same kind, and if they see a decoy, a bird that looks like themselves or another seabird, then they're more likely to come in. They enhance the con with a siren's call for the a'o, the sounds of other Newell shearwaters. They hear those vocalizations as they fly by, and they see the decoys on the ground. We find that the nests that are occupied first are the ones that are most adjacent to the speakers. And if they find those suitable and start breeding there, you have a colony. That new colony is taking hold in the enclosure, where a couple dozen birds now return to breed. Jay and his team have gotten to know one pair in particular. An adult in here has been sitting on that egg for about 52 days. The egg is pipping. It has a cracked open part of the shell and we could hear the chick peeping within there. Sweet. It's pipping. Did you hear it? Yes, I awesome. heard it chipping. Nice. This pair that has been breeding in here, this will be their third chick raised in this colony. This is definitely a sign of hope. This is exactly why we are here, is to have these birds being able to successfully breed and build their population. In time, these chicks may also return here to raise another generation. Thanks to this newly fashioned habitat on the mountains and one reclaimed along the highly developed coast, both of these shearwaters now have safe harbor on the very islands they help bring to life. 20 years ago, walking through Havea, there wouldn't have been any seabirds here. We wouldn't have had any nesting Waokani in their burrows. And now, 20 years later, there are now over 3,000 nesting burrows at Havea. There are literally thousands of seabirds underneath. These efforts here aren't just local successes. They're also models for how communities elsewhere can make space for wildlife. Seabirds can be very successful and coexist in areas where humans also are very successful. We just have to pay attention to where they are, give them their space so they can set up their burrows and raise their chicks. In return, the seabirds provide us with the joy that comes from being part of this native ecosystem. 
We can use it as an example to show people how just a little bit of effort can result in such a huge success. Thanks for watching this episode. If you'd like to dive deeper into this story or learn how you can help protect biodiversity near you, visit wildhope.tv. And come back on Mondays for more Wild Hope right here at PBS Nature on YouTube.